for the of the protest tonight. Okay, so there, there's, been a pro, there's been a few protests going on um, tonight and earlier today. Um, most of them have been focused around the Lowe's Hotel in Center City. Um, there were, I think from 1 to, sorry, from 11 to 1 there was a die-in. Um, that was mostly a, a protest of what President Trump is saying he's going to be doing towards the rights of a lot of the LGBTQ in the community. And so we're protesting against that. Um, but there's also been a lot of protests going on around um, the recent announcement that Trump's been making about the wall that he would like to build um, between U.S. and Mexico. So there's a number of different protests going on tonight, and we hope that if, if you're so inspired, that you will join us as we go and, um, later on in the center city. So there's two questions. Okay, so there's a few ways that you can get down into center city. Um, I would say the main one is going to be SEPTA. There's also regional rail, which will take you to Jefferson, which is the closest I think you'll be able to get to Lowe's Hotel. So to get a regional rail, what you do is you go out the front doors of Tyler, you take a left, and you walk about five to seven minutes, and you'll see the L, um, the tracks are right there, and you go off the, the what else you got? Yeah. All right, cool. Um, so thank you guys all for coming out tonight. Um, obviously we're here for one reason, which is to celebrate the work of Martha Rossler and hear what she's got to say to us tonight. <laughs> Again, in the interest of brevity, I'm not going to go through her CV that would take all oh, the whole hour. Um, but what I would like to say is that when Martha got here um, and we started talking about what it is that she's going to talk about, there were all kinds of different sort of theoretical things that we could talk about. But um, we started talking about protest and why we do it. And so Martha, as much as she can tonight, is going to focus her message to us tonight about why we protest. Um, but before I hand over the mic, I do want to send a big thank you because bringing people like Martha to Tyler um, doesn't just happen on Temple Contemporary's effort, it's a school-wide initiative. And so I want to make a big thank you, I get this wrong, um, to the universities, uh, Paley Library, the General Activities Fees, and the Departments of Art Education, Community Arts, Art History, Visual Studies, Painting, Drawing, and Sculpture, and Graphic and Interactive Design. So please join me in welcoming Martha Rossi. Hi, thanks for coming. Um, I have a bit of a quandary. I know you're here to hear about art, and I think that's, you know, good, uh, even great, but the Republican uh, committee, as you know, as you just heard, is meeting uh, all this week downtown, and I consider without hyperbole to say that the country is in a kind of a state of emergency and that it's necessary to make a showing. It's necessary to show up and protest if at all possible. Sorry, I got the pox. Um, and the quandary is not that I think we should all just get up now and go, though I urge any of you who feel that that's your agenda to please do that, you, you know, this talk will be recorded or whatever. Uh, and work is work, but I think we really need to accept what our role as citizens is now. And I have never said this before in a forum like this where I've been invited to appear as an artist. But I've been asked to talk a bit about what, why it's important to show up. First of all, I'll tell you what I think the basic maxim is which is that it's only feet in the streets that make governments tremble. This is a basic axiom that every leader, every ruler, every politician knows that when the people go into the streets, it's time to worry. Keith Ellison said, you know, politicians be politicians, but when they start to feel the heat, that's when it matters. That's just a paraphrase, but that's what he was saying to his fellow Democratic Party brethren, but to all of you as well. I would say you need to show up and show up and show up. Collectivism is nice, but physical presence is what makes the difference. Writing and calling your local reps, expressing support, all of that's important but being in the streets is what makes the difference. I know some of you think, hmm, 
yeah, well, we did it. Really doesn't do anything. Things are still rolling along. It only makes them angry. But believe me, there's a long history in the world. And the history in the world says that when people show up, governments travel, as I said. So as you can see, I'm pretty advanced in years. I'm a veteran, a product of the 60s. And it's my generation that rediscovered protest, which had been shut down in the 50s, though this was a very active country in the 30s. And my professors and betters, all of whom were sympathetic liberals, said, don't protest. It doesn't do anything. Don't go on demonstrations. It doesn't do anything. We're talking about the 60s. It did a hell of a lot starting with civil rights marches, anti-war marches, marches for every possible subject, gender rights, LGBTQ rights, immigrant rights, all the things that we care about now, and I know I'm not presenting an exhaustive list, but all the things that matter to us now in terms of social movements or a product of the marches, demonstrations, and meetings of the 60s. This is a legacy we can't afford to ignore. <coughs> meetings are boring. Protesting is exhilarating, actually. and It should be fun, but we got to do it. So I'm urging you to come with me later in, in an hour or so, and we can go talk, uh, pro talk loudly together, present, represent. We need to represent. We need to be in the streets. I'm sorry. The, the, what you saw as you just walked in was a Martha-caused meltdown <laughs> of the technology. So the uh, videos I was hoping to show you, even though they're short, don't seem to want to comply, even though it's an actual physical DVD. We couldn't get it to play. Well, we could. So I'm going to fall back onto my PowerPoint. Now, my problem is always the following. I've worked for so many years, and I've worked in so many different media that it's really difficult to give you a sense of what it is I do or care about or have done. And I, feel, I felt in producing the presentation that it was the face of me that isn't the one talking to you now saying we are in a state of emergency. As I said, I've never stood in front of an audience and said that before. So let's see what I can show you, and maybe we can pull something out of that. Sorry, I'm also going to have some throat problems. We'll get the PowerPoint. Right. Yeah. So there are a whole range of different types of works that I've done and projects and different subjects in different media. And I just am going to show a rough cut into the works by saying there are works in public, works that circulate outside institutions, outside institutions, not in places like this, not in museums, not in galleries, but rather in the big world. Um, works that are made up of site-specific projects, whether they are about the present or the past, and group projects that are collective, collaborative, or participatory, or all of those, or some of those. So collective means the project belongs to everybody, it's organized by everybody, it's uh, put together by everybody, uh, and, but it also could be my idea working with other people. Collaborative is not my idea, it's our idea. And participatory is that kind of strange gray zone where, well, you know, whatever. Um, in a way, this is a participatory event, even though it's sort of classic uh, audience and speaker. Get rid of my voice. So this is just a 
Did that show up on screen before? Just this one. I'm not going to press more than once. <clears throat> so, different types of <laughs> garage sales obviously are not collaborative or cooperative. When I do them, they are participatory, however. It's a garage sale, but it's my garage sale. And I may have people working with me, but it's still my garage sale, as I define it. Uh, the Oleana Spaceship Station I did with a bunch of my students at the Venice Biennale in 2003. That was collaborative and also contentious. Because naturally, 30 people don't agree. Um, fascination with the game of the exploding historical hollow leg which was an anti-war show that I did at UC Boulder, University of Colorado Boulder, was a project that I did with the collaboration of students, but basically it was my project. So, or cooperation of students. Um, the garage sales we see here again, but also you may know, <laughs> so I'm sorry, in, in addition to the technological problem, there is the voice problem, which came from nowhere. Um, but it's an allergic reaction. Semiotics of the Kitchen, as you may know, is a video widely available online that I did quite a number of years ago that has served as a kind of a template for other people to make videos that follow very much along the line of a kind of feminist uh, relationship to the tools and the setting of every day. About, uh, I guess, 12 years ago now, uh, I did a restaging of the work, which was never a work in public, but only always a video, um, with a, we put out a call, we called it an audition, and 26 young women uh, actresses mostly, curators and artists showed up and we did together three rounds in which everybody participated in the redoing of the work. So that was a collaboration as a work, but of course it was my script. Um, I've done a number of live performances. I'm having real trouble with my voice, I'm surprised. Um, some of which are political in a most direct way, like um, the cusp of the 80s, which I want to point out had to do with the onset of the Reagan regime, which in many ways is similar to the present moment. Let me just take a minute and say, <laughs> I'm not sure why my voice is quite this constricted right now, but I know one of the things it does is that it produces sympathetic responses in you Let's just pretend it's a bad audio uh, projection. <laughs> it has nothing to do with actual distress on my part, because uh, I'm not feeling distressed. Okay, so this was called The Cusp of the 80s, and it was a performance about the relationship between the Reagan regime and essentially Latin America and the kind of covert wars we were operating. Um, I won't talk about the others except the other, th well, except to say that the others up there are about women's lives and also imperialism. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, um, and unfortunately, I've had to accept, and I'm afraid you will too, that we live in a war like war making and now, once again, war loving nation. Uh, full stop. And so I've had to be an anti-war artist for many years. And I'll show you some of the various things that I've done over the years to deal with the fact that I am against the wars that we have fought. But I'm gonna start with something totally different, which is a little bit more about your life. I don't know if you know what a coin vortex is. Yeah, okay, so you know. You put your penny, quarter, nickel, dime in, and you lose it. But <laughs> so this is a coin vortex, very popular for raising money for churches and so on. In fact, when I was invited to be part of this project, 
uh, said to my assistant, what I really think I should do is make a toilet, you know, where the uh, money goes right around. I said, you mean like a coin vortex? And I had no idea what he was talking about. So this is an actual uh, fabricated metal coin vortex um, with words on it and on infographics, God bless infographics, um, which I stole from the internet. on that piece. Um, so I am not above petty, strange work, um, but also rather populist works like the next one. Um, it's clearing up a little bit. The Theater of Drones. I was asked to do a project in Charlottesville, Virginia at the photo festival. And I was asked would I make something for their, uh, it was called the Free Speech Wall, which is uh, between a very large mall and City Hall. And I looked at the preceding projects and I did a, a little bit of research on Charlottesville. And what I discovered was that Charlottesville is the home of anti-drone protests, both domestic and military. The John Whitehead of the Rutherford Institute, who is essentially a libertarian lawyer, um, managed to get the city to produce the first anti-drone ordinance, uh, and that was about domestic surveillance. And um, David Sampson of Roots.org also lives in Charlottesville, and he was running uh, the anti-military predator drone campaign. So for my public presentation, I invited them both to speak as well as uh, uh, I gave my presentation. So I'll just show you some of the, uh, some of the uh, banners, which of course you can't read, but I do want to point out, I'm sorry about the popping. Is that the best we can do, really? Should I stand in a different place? <laughs> for science fiction fans and for those watching Man in the High Castle, this who's up there now. This is from a book by Philip K. Dick from like the year God, like nineteen sixty two or something, about exactly. I mean, Philip K. Dick, if nothing else, was a prescient paranoid. <laughs> So he had this whole stuff about drones. The other thing that I did for this was I uh, got an image of every single drone that could be found that was under development because I knew that it would attract young men to look at the banners, which it did. <laughs> okay, I'm just, they don't get hungry, they're not afraid, they don't forget their orders, they don't care if the guy next to them has been shot. Will they do a better job than humans? Yes. So why we like drones. Same reason why we like robots at work. We. And these are two more banners. And uh, way to protest. And then it uh, wound up in Spain as well, but not outdoors. OK. Now, big leap backward in time. Um, to photo montage work that I started doing in the mid-60s, uh, which was about the representation of women in magazines and in public in general. And I'm gonna go through some of these very quickly. The point about the photo montages that I did is that they should be immediately obvious to you, even if what they are saying is possibly a little less obvious than what hits the eye. What I'm saying is you can read these as you will, but uh, because there's always more to be said about an image than the immediate obvious visible stuff. So 
So three separate ones. That's um, a Magritte, essentially, on the left. Here's two more. That's Bastien Lepage, um, Joan of Arc, very popular with nuns at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, I often see. And this is one. <laughs> this seems to be on a timer, it's doing what it wants. Um, this is uh, a work about invisible labor, both the labor of women on their faces, but also the actual physical labor of the men of color on the docks, which many people don't see when they look at this work. They can see the glamour, but they're not actually paying any attention to the invisible labor. This is called Hot House Harem, and it's after Angla. You should look up the Angla portrait um, if you want to know what I'm doing. And I will make a comment about this one, which is, it's about women of color, which it isn't. It's about women in orange, blue, green, and uh, purple, but essentially white, except for the woman who I put in the forefront, who is the standout uh, presence. And then I realized that I could bring this same tactic to my increasing horror and shock about the war that we were engaging in in Vietnam. And uh, I'll show you some of those images. It's the same technique of bringing together two disparate universes of discourse within the same field. In the case of war, it's the here and the there. In the case of the images of women, there are a number of issues, one being pornography versus respectability, but a number of others as well. Not all the anti-war images show images of combat, but that's the starting point. This one is the signature image of the set, and it is, for those of you who know, that's Giacometti's, um, also a signature piece. I forget what it's called, Walking Man, Burning Man. Um, and uh, this one very clearly fits my supposition that some people are entitled to fine art and fine interiors and other people are entitled to lie dead outside our windows, by which I was referring to the fact that we could see this stuff on TV. It was not invisible. And I'll just show you a couple of things about how they were produced and how they were disseminated. So mostly from Life magazine. On the left, you have the Life spread. On the right, the resulting image. Here as well, with one difference. This is how the works were actually disseminated. They were disseminated as Xeroxes or in newspapers, underground press, not ever, never, in an art context, never. It wasn't until 20 years later that I even considered having them in an art magazine or in a gallery. Since then, I say, those aren't the works. They are representatives of the works. These are the works, black and white, and great old. I'm going to try and move quickly through these. I'm sorry about that. You know, I realize the technology problem was one thing, but my voice problem is more annoying. So this is Pat Nixon, first lady. So when they remind you that there are now gold curtains in the White House, we can say, gold, we've been there before. It's not as though every Republican administration has not done the same thing. Turn the 
president into an authoritarian, godlike figure, the only problem is we have now reached a point where it's actually possible not for him to be Caligula or any of that stuff, but to actually turn us into a significantly different nation before he gets tossed out on his ass. That is Faye Dunaway and Bonnie and Clyde in the time book. So there is no image here of a war victim, though our picture of free Melania was at that point Pat Nixon, who people used to say the woman looks like a cardboard cutout because she could only stand and smile. Just saying. So that was my stint with photo montages. That was latest 72 or three, I didn't date them, but that's around when I quit. Because we stopped bombing Vietnam in 73. And I stopped making the images. And then, lo and behold, another war. So I decided to return to the same old stuff because I knew that people would say, wait, what? You did that already. Can't teach an old dog new tricks. And I would say, maybe you could tell me what we are doing now that's different from what we did back then. Because we weren't doing anything different. And in fact, the war in Afghanistan, which we're still in, is our longest war. So this is Lindsay, England. Who was implicated in the uh, shocking and catastrophic um, revelations about Abu Ghraib, which engaged, was a prison in which people engaged in torture and bad behavior, but nothing like we did in the so-called black sites around the world into which President Trump says he would like to return only works. This is a man, a returning soldier, with this, one of the two signature injuries of the war, which is a traumatic limb amputation, the other being traumatic brain injury, which is not picturable. And that's George and Jed. So most of these images are straight out of print sources, but Lindsay England came off the internet, and so does that picture. And I'll show you what the, the background picture is this. US Marines dressed as gladiators, stage a chariot race reminiscent of Charlton Heston movie, complete with confiscated Iraqi horses at their base outside Fallujah. In other words, our guys to build themselves up, stole some horses, and acted like Roman gladiators, or no, not gladiators, legionnaires. Um, the photo is by Anya Niedringhaus, and I have to say that Anya Niedringhaus was a great war photographer who died shooting war um, a number of years later. So I'll just show you the image again. There's a protester there. There's another Abu Ghraib photo at the top and our guys in front. I'll show you the, uh, see this is what Photoshop allowed me to do. It's not to make a picture out of Photoshop, but to have inclusions and resize and reposition them so a soldier wiping his face with the American flag, a picture of um, Flora Piastewa, first Native American woman known to have died fighting as a member of the US forces rather than dying at their hands, uh, an Iraqi woman in a position of supplication, and a picture of the My Lai massacre, which was one of the great underground, exposed, leaked revelations 
of the war in Vietnam where we massacred a few hundred, mostly old men, women, and children, and uh, our forces covered it up. Sorry. That was me for 2004, and then I got asked to um, give a magazine called Modern Painters something to put on the cover of their magazine. And I said, well, I can't use something from 2004, because it was 2008, so I made a new one for them. I asked them, where are your logos and your text boxes, and I just made another one for them. But I'm a bit obsessive, so I couldn't stop. Before and during, I also was a member of a group called Artists Against the War. We engaged in all kinds of hijinks and uh, activities. Um, mostly I'm not a good designer, so most of the actual designs were done by brilliant people. Uh, I just worked as a member of the group. Um, this was an action. Um, showing you in advance of what the result of this was, which is a banner drop at the Hart office building. So here's, you know, banner painting. War torture lies and we will not be silent. So I'm going to stop there with the anti-war stuff and I was asked to talk about the following work but I, and its implications, but it may not make any sense. So I'm just going to say that a great deal of what I've been concerned with is what does it mean to take someone's picture and to turn it into a photograph? What does it mean? And after all, the work that I did about women's bodies and women's representation is literally about the question of how do we picture people how do we create images of others? With whom do we identify? And with whom do we refuse to identify? That's been a guiding principle in my work from the beginning of who is us and who is them. So this was a work called, as it says, The Bowery and Two Inadequate Descriptive Systems. And it is about the practice, the social practice of photography and the representation of others. Now, most of the work that I had done, which I alluded to way at the beginning, was about making things to not be in our institutions, museums, galleries, and so on. This work was made to be in a museum or a gallery next to other works of documentary photography and to say, is there something to talk about here? So it's, as you see, it's a grid with a lot of images and texts. The texts are also photographs, and I'll just show you some of the images. The Bowery is a place where drunk people hung out and lived, people who have been essentially evicted from normal society and who are rejected and despised by most for being hopeless drunks and have their own society, in a sense, their own social group. And I was interested not only in talking about the photos, because photography is an act of metonymy. I wanted to extract the figure from the ground and just present the ground and talk about it as a territoriality, a matter of territoriality, and who gets to, in the real world and also in the photographic image who gets to hold ground. But also, I wanted to bring in a kind of another voice, the voice which is more collective of the systems of language by which we talk about stages of drunkenness and drunks. And so there's a poetics of drunkenness here as well. 
most of them organized into systems like nautical ones, ones relating to food, ones relating to industrial processes, and then just British slang, actually. So much outdated British slang. And then just sort of all dead soldiers, dead Marines, which refers to empty bottles, which it turns out are in every picture. So in a way, it's the way that the shoes are supposed to represent Jackson Pollock, the painter, the empty bottles represent the dispossessed on the street. This is a shot of my notebook where I just ask people, hey, how do you say drunk? How do you say very drunk? How do you say mildly drunk? What do you call a drunk? Uh, I'll just mention in passing that I'm interested in passing, not <laughs> passing in the sense of identity passing, but in the fact that we're always in transit, passing through spaces where we are not connected with the people with whom we're in a group, but rather are kind of in a Brownian motion. Um, and I think this is one of the salient facts of our life is that we're always in passage because we spend so much time thinking about the virtual world and the internet. We tend to forget how the discourse about the alienation of modern life and our disconnectedness from deep roots is, uh, has been a central discourse of the 20th century. We've forgotten to talk about alienation. talk about the Cuba photos because it's too complicated, so they're going to fly past. Pictures of people. All right, so this is where you can just cover your eyes and take a quick break. Um, This is a work that I've been working on since 2000, no, uh, wow, well, since 1990, um, about South Africa and its transition. But um, yeah, we're not gonna really have time, just know that it's there. I'm gonna talk about a couple of events that I've held in public because all of this, especially coming out of a voice where the voice box is not that cooperative, sound a little bit grim. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a project I did in Poland, which was called Guide for the Perplexed, How to Succeed in the New Poland. Poland has now gone full fash, I have to say, uh, which is really a shame. Um, so, I held a series of public meetings, which is not a common thing in Poland to talk about all kinds of things, um, and to ask people to make notes and to speak up and talk out how to be an artist in the new Poland, how to manage my debt, environment or succeeding through coal because it's an extractive economy, labor, and that's a checkout counter, how can I get a job, immigration, out migration, gender, or how to be a woman in the new Poland. One of the uh, speakers on that panel was the only transgender member of any parliament uh, in Europe at the time, um, uh, uh, who was in Poland. Housing, or how can I get an apartment? What should we put in the newish, new Jewish museum, which was a box full of old artifacts, and should there be a Polish colony on Mars? which was a question about Polish identity. When I came up with that one, I was told, you know, in the 20s, the Poles went to Madagascar to try to figure out if they should establish a colony on Madagascar and then decide it wasn't worth their time. But I do want to point out that one of the great anthropologists of the beginning of the 20th century was a Pole, Bruno Malinowski. Um, the Poles have always, well, 
Poland has a really complicated history. There was a long time when Poles were slaves, or when many slaves were Poles, just to say. We also had an empire and all kinds of stuff I can't go into right now. Um, so I'll just say in passing, I did a large garden project with uh, people in Singapore, and one of the, um, so the library project jumped one. So I'll show you the Singapore Biennale. Keep hold that thought. I've also had a traveling library of about 7,500 books, which you could photocopy, but you couldn't borrow. Um, back to the Singapore Biennale, where um, Singapore is an island. It's been there a long time, but it only became a nation about 40 years ago or so, under partly because the guy who was responsible for trying to turn it into a nation after the British decolonial period uh, was a pretty tough guy to get along with. He tried to join with, I think, Malaysia, and they eventually they kicked him out. His name is Lee Kuan Yew. He was known as the master gardener. So everybody I invited knew that the garden could be a garden or it could be a metaphor in whatever way they chose. I invited people from every sector, but mostly it was a women's project, even though we see a number of men there. And then it turned out that all the labor was done by completely unprotected legal immigrant workers from Bangladesh and I think Pakistan, while all the domestic servants were from Indonesia and Malaysia. The idea being that the two groups shouldn't be able to talk with each other, but they're teenagers, so they certainly know how to talk with each other and get together and get in trouble. Um, this group is uh, household workers who are granted no time off unless the employer wants them to have time off. So these were ones who Employers were mostly academics who gave them days off so they could be in the project. I worked with students of all kinds. Okay, so that's one, and this is the final group. I'm gonna stop very soon because we really need to talk rather than this, but. Um, so really the point of this project was not to produce a garden, but to have in public a group largely led and populated by women of all ages and generations in Singapore in public because there's really no space for that, I was told by my female Singapore friends. So it was again about representing and working together. And then there's this, because this is, although one may say there are serious issues here, there's also a joyous event. In fact, many of them how I wound up doing all these, don't ask me. It's not my intention, but I hope you all know what a garage sale is, because if you don't, I'm dead. But, um, so this is in MoMA. Uh, in just in the Christmas shopping season, late November 2012. And I employed a wedding photographer from Brooklyn to take pictures of people and the objects they purchased if they wanted, and virtually no one said no. Uh, so there were many pictures, and we had a live stream, and also the, the constant replay of the pictures of many people being very happy with things they bought. And someone bought the car, which was a big point of contention with the museum, because they were sure no one would buy the car. In fact, people were bidding for the car because of biodiesel, it was a Mercedes. And we did two newspapers. And the last thing I'm gonna say is that I have done a lot of work about real estate, gentrification, and so on. I did three shows about it this year, and I'm not gonna talk about it because 
I have a feeling that that's such a big discussion that we ought to stay off that right now. Uh, I hope you agree with me. Let's see if I can pull up a couple of minutes of this since the TVP doesn't want to play. I feel like I sound like a total crazy person. I'm not that crazy. <laughs> All the way down. Enter full screen. Duh. Okay. So this is 62 minutes of torture, though it's not because of, oh, I guess it's not going to be any minutes of torture. How is this possible? <laughs> this is straight off video. <laughs> um, should I refresh? that logo first. It's also not playing full screen. If it, yeah. Where it says download no, in the video. Oh, video. oh, oh on the video. video. Oh, oh, yeah. 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 You know, there's, I hate that, you know, I have to say, but also I don't hear any noise. The gods are against me. Maybe we should just have a Q&A. assume that torture is impermissible a throwback to a more brutal age. Enlightened society is rejected outright, and regimes suspected of using it risk the wrath of the United States. I believe this attitude is unwise. There are situations in which torture is not merely permissible, but morally mandatory. Moreover, these situations are moving from the realm of imagination to fact. Society is rejected outright, and regimes suspected of using it risk the wrath of the United States. I believe this attitude is unwise. There are situations in which torture is not merely permissible, but morally mandatory. Moreover, these situations are moving from the realm of imagination to fact. terrorist has hidden an atomic bomb on Manhattan Island, which will detonate on July 4th unless. Here follow the usual demands for money and release of his friends from jail. Suppose further that he is caught at 10 a.m. of the fateful day, but won't disclose where the bomb is. What do we do? If we follow due process, wait for his lawyer, arraign him, millions of people will die. 
If the only way to save those lives is to subject the terrorists to the most excruciating possible pain, what grounds can there be for not doing so? Torturing the terrorist is unconstitutional? Probably. But millions of lives surely outweigh constitutionality. Torture is barbaric. Mass murder is far more barbaric. Indeed, letting millions of innocents die in deference to one who flaunts his guilt as moral cowardice, an unwillingness to dirty one's hands. If you caught the terrorist, would you sleep nights knowing that millions died because you couldn't bring yourself to apply the electrodes? Someone plants a bomb on a jumbo jet. Surely we can, must, do anything to the extortionist to save the passengers. How can we tell 300 or 100 or 10 people who never asked to be put in danger? I'm sorry, you'll just have to die in agony. We just couldn't bring ourselves to. Suppose a terrorist group kidnapped a newborn baby from a hospital. I asked four mothers if they would approve of torturing kidnappers if that were necessary to get their newborns back. All said yes, the most liberal adding that she would like to administer it herself. I am not advocating torture as punishment. I am advocating torture as an acceptable measure to prevent future evil. So understood, it is far less objectionable than many extant punishments. Opponents of the death penalty are forever insisting that executing a murderer will not bring back his victim, as if the purpose of capital punishment were supposed to be resurrection, not deterrence or retribution. But torture is intended to keep innocents from being dispatched. The most powerful argument against using torture as a punishment or to secure confession is that such practices disregard the rights of the individual. Well, if the individual is all that important, and he is, it is correspondingly important to protect the rights of individuals threatened by terrorists. If life is so valuable that it must never be taken, the lives of innocents must be saved, even at the price of hurting the one who endangers them. Better precedents for torture are assassination and preemptive attack. If Nation A learns that Nation B is about to launch an unprovoked attack, A has the right to save itself by destroying B's military capability first. In the same way, if the police can, by torture, save those who would otherwise die at the hands of kidnappers or terrorists, they must. Idealism. There is an important difference between terrorists and their victims that should mute talk of terrorist rights. The terrorist victims are at risk unintentionally. Unlike his victims, the terrorist volunteered for the risks of his deed. By threatening to kill for profit or idealism, he renounces civilized standards, and he can have no complaint if civilization tries to thwart him by whatever means necessary. Ah, but how can the authorities ever be sure they have the right malefactor? Isn't there a danger of error and abuse? Won't we turn into them? Questions like these are disingenuous in a world in which terrorists proclaim themselves and perform for television. The name of their game is public recognition. Clear guilt is difficult to define, but when 40 million people see a group of masked gunmen sees an airplane on the evening news, there is not much question about who the perpetrators are. There will be hard cases where the situation is murkier. Nonetheless, a line demarcating the legitimate use of torture can be drawn. The line between us and them will remain clear. There is little danger that the Western democracies will lose their way if they choose to inflict pain as one way of preserving order. Paralysis in the face of evil is the greater danger. Someday soon a terrorist will threaten tens of thousands of lives and torture will be the only way to save them. Someday soon a terrorist will threaten tens of thousands of lives 
and torture will be the only way to save them. We had better start thinking about this. Levin is a professor of philosophy at the City College of New York. City College of New York. Got in trouble for publishing, unsurprisingly, racist stuff about African Americans. Anyway, enough of this. together smoothly and everything is professional and everything is from BBC files and you become completely disempowered but I have to say this is my most disempowering video um, uh, why don't we talk no 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 <laughs> Interpreting. <laughs> it looked like a possibly dead or injured child, yeah. and I looked at that and tried to analyze it with classes. Who is the man in the phone screen? Because um, I, it actually, looks like a yeah. important person to know who that is. Uh, really? Okay, so <laughs> I shouldn't have closed it out, but let's see. I sometimes have a, a close up of those two images, but let me see. photos of two men doing, so women who are crying tend to, or asking for supplication do this, and men expressing grief do this. These are kind of gestures that you see often in, in pictures of Iraqi guys and women. We're not getting, God, not really, I'm totally you're unloved here. Um, <laughs> Uh, technologically at least so I don't think they're the same guy it's two different people but it's funny you say selfie there I did do one with selfies um, actually no the work didn't even exist ten years ago <laughs> because people it was not a well-known phenomenon these are she's looking at a picture of a man well, there's two of her and there's two of them. So I wish we could see it because I'd like you to see that. Nice. <laughs> that um, those are injured girls. <laughs> 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 Note to self, don't do this again and see the ear, nose, and throat doctor again. <laughs> Resume conversation. Um, yeah, so it's somebody. Uh, asking for uh, uh, right so it is to it the pictures of the young girls are of injured young girls they are not dead I tend very 
I even very rarely put a, there's almost no blood in any of the works. And, right. Shock. <laughs> yeah. Really? Um, <clears throat> so you see the guys doing, one guy's doing this, and the other guy's doing something similar. I can't even see the other guy from here, but yeah. And those girls are wounded. Um, I don't know what else to say. So, but if you want to take a second, since we, we don't want that many questions, but I'm really, I, I've impeded you. So just tell me what you, conclusion you came to with your classes. Um, well, we, we talked about the kind of narcissism of American culture, like, oh, sorry. We were, well, we discussed a lot of different possibilities, but one possibility was that maybe this was um, a man who had, uh, who had done something or, or been witness to something. That's right. And he was not really visible to Americans because the Iraqi people have been largely invisible in our media as compared with the earlier photographic and, and journalistic images that were saturating mm -hmm. American culture during mm -hmm. the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. American living rooms filled with right. stuff. So returning to the idea of the reality of war and the sort of jarring disjunction between this interior and the exterior mm -hmm. um, and the, the children actually in the space, yes. which was a change, I, I thought, in this series. And then this, she seemed totally obsessed with her self and her own glamour. That's why I thought maybe it, it could be a selfie, but yes, that was predating selfie. Oh, right, so I would say I agree with everything as being what I was thinking about, but I would say it's screen culture. And in the room with her are these young women. Outside the window is carnage. The doubling is meant to suggest a kind of narcissism, you know, that a kind of multiplication of the self. But what she's shocked about is something that can only come to her as a screen image as opposed to in the space she inhabits. Mm -hmm. And of course, they don't inhabit the space since this is clearly a fiction. And I do want to say I always want people to hold on to the fact that these are fictional spaces and not meant to be the basis for a narrative of actual uh, confrontation. I think for me that's really important. So your interpretation, I agree with, except that in terms of chronological moment, I couldn't foresee the selfie culture, uh, and it's, you know, but screen culture we knew all about, right? So thank you. Anyone else have a question? Oh, come on. <laughs> what sort of Wait, sorry, he's going back so you can be next, all right? Okay. Um, sorry, I'm still kind of sick, so I sound like a child, but um, I'm looking at your work in Singapore. I'm curious as to your thoughts on Guggenheim, Abu Dhabi, and like groups like the Gold Liver Artists Coalition. Like, is that something that you would ever work with? I would have worked with them if I wasn't so completely slammed with work, to use an ugly phrase, that I couldn't. And then somebody did a work, I can't remember the name, that was exactly like what I would have done, which was essentially based on placing workers within a space, and I thought, well, you know, good. <laughs> um, but those are my friends. That's my reference group, Gulf Labor people, so yeah. Um, and what do I think about Guggenheim Abu Dhabi? I was awarded a Guggenheim Lifetime Achievement Award, and when I uh, picked up the prize, I talked about their need to pull out of these uh, coalitions if they couldn't manage to arrange for decent protection for the workers and decent wages. So um, that's what I think of it. That, you know, they're engaged in criminal activities and we ought to acknowledge that. There was a question here.
what sort of uh, print organizations were these, um, the war at home photos disseminated through? Were these independent? Oh, thank you for asking. Mainly, they were disseminated as Xeroxes. I don't have any photos of the Xeroxes because who would take a picture of a Xerox? And then they basically deteriorated. So, God, then people write about them as though they were disseminated in underground newspapers, but they, I have those. So <laughs> I've shown, okay, now I have to figure out what to do. So now when the, they're shown, and museums want to show the newspapers, I say, you can put them in a vitrine, but you have to have Xeroxes next to them, because it doesn't matter if the Xeroxes are from now or from the olden days, but people need to see they were really hand handbills. Flyers. Uh, so the underground newspapers were, um, uh, the main one was one I was working with, which was called Goodbye to All That, which was a feminist newspaper in San Diego, where I've been living where I lived for most of the 70s. Uh, and there were other, there was a, a vibrant underground newspaper culture, which kind of led to zine culture, but it was much broader, and uh, every city had underground newspapers, and uh, it's uh, a shame we've lost them. Maybe we need to restart them, though maybe online is a better way, but there's nothing like a handbill. And the reason that it's important to say they were flyers is that there were tons of anti-war flyers, and there still are, but they tend to be full of words, 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 ranting about this and that political group and uh, against the crimes of the US and all this stuff that you just didn't want to read while you were going off on a march or anything. You look at it and throw it in the garbage. And it occurred to me that I wanted to do some that had no words. So one has the native caption attached to um, that, you know, about the view and so on. And that's one that got printed in one of the newspapers, so I show it. But mostly there are no words on these. They're pictures. You look at them, you get it, or you don't. And as I said, they were black and white. So I'm really glad you asked. Um, you were talking about sort of how you've been making these collages uh, during these anti-war collages mm -hmm. during the 70s. Mm -hmm. And then after, you know, they declared Vietnam ended, you well. stopped making them. Mm -hmm. um, and then you picked back up in around the 2000s for mm -hmm. the Iraqi Afghani war. Um, that's also around the time sort of people in history sort of stopped protesting. Like there were a lot of, there were many movements sort of related to human rights. And then once sort of the end of the 70s, people just stopped. It, it's almost like along with the Vietnam protests, so did many other human rights. I'm sorry, I'm trying to ask Take your time, okay? <laughs> um, do you think that had they kept fighting, or had, like, do you think protesting has of late been a bit of a bandwagon, or has it been, you know? What's wrong with bandwagons? <laughs> no. Um, Let's get to the heart of your question. I. I Maybe you could take a second. Yeah, I think you're, you're asking, first you're saying it stopped, and now it's back, but maybe now it doesn't mean very much? It's just kind of a thing? No, no, that was well, what I was implying. I think that's how it came out, but. Um. <laughs> well, I'd love to answer you, but I'm having a little trouble locating yeah. where we're going. It's an important issue. Let me just take a minute to say that it's not that protesting stopped, it's that it stopped being about things uh, that were gonna be covered by the Reagan administration, which, but I will say that in 1982, and get ready for shock, there were a million people in Central Park in New York, and there were marches all around the world, particularly Europe, 
against nuclear war because, and that's what a little bit the torture tape is about, that Reagan was essentially threatening to blow up the world. He, off mic, made little jokes that got uh, transmitted of the bombing begins in five minutes, that's a famous one. And he was always saying sort of threatening things when he'd say things like, go ahead, make my day, you know, to the Russians. And meanwhile, he wound up negotiating very important anti-nuclear or nuclear wind down stuff, but he started Star Wars, which was bullshit, um, but was actually, it was supposed to be a defensive shield. I don't mean Star Wars the movie, you may think it's bullshit, you may not, but I'm talking about a program <laughs> This nuclear missile defense. There was a huge amount of militarism. So let me just say, millions of people marched against nuclear war. He did eventually wind up, and also the doctrine of mad mutual assured destruction. Um, so these are moments of history that have been erased from our consciousness. And many, many marches. And the anti-war thing that I did in, in Colorado, fascination with the game of the exploding historical hollow leg. Also, I had a symposium with students and people from the community. So there was a whole anti-nuclear element and um, readings from history, but there were also Central American activists because what the, do the doctrine of Reagan was to engage in what were called Bush Wars, that, and also with suppression of the press. At first they tried blanking out the press, which I guess Steve Bannon just told the press to shut up today. But then they decided to institute pools, and in the uh, Iraq War, it was embeddedness. So there were many marches Cisface and other groups against the wars in Central America. We engaged in proxy wars in Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Honduras. We're still uh, messing up Honduras. So, um, are you leaving? Yeah. No. <laughs> okay. I'm handing back. It's okay. I'm sorry. I guess the question I originally, or if I did, it was fitting. I guess I want your thoughts on sort of that gap, but uh, I think that I'm was saying my that there was a gap. In of there's a gap in coverage. There were, but that's not, and then 1999, of course, Seattle, which brought together a broad coalition of groups against the World Trade Organization, and um, so it was called the Alt-Globalization Movement against, you know, the neoliberalization of our entire economy. Part of the issue there was that labor groups and environmental groups came together with other forms of activism and it was impossible to ignore, especially since we actually did shut down the WTO. That was 99 and since then there have been protests. But I do have to point out that being in the streets is not something you can do once. I can't keep saying this too often. Everyone will say this now if you go online and say, you know, there are supposedly 100 days of activism after the fantastic marches of this Saturday. Um, but everyone will eventually come across something that says, you know, we have to keep going, and we do. And the issue for activists and participants is to figure out what level of participation you can be comfortable with or watch us slide ever more quick, quickly into something that's looking pretty bad. So that's my best answer. I do want to say, I just realized what's wrong with my voice. I have the flu, which I forgot. <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> I, it has to be cute face, but so, sorry. We'll try to take uh, two more questions. Sure. And uh, I apologize for slow. Thank you again for your talk. I'm curious, you've written a lot about, and spoken a lot about um, the relationship between artists and artists' role in society and kind of uh, society, really. Um, is there anything maybe that you're seeing particularly today with the Trump administration, with the current status of the internet, um, where like I, I kind of feel that you can imagine artists playing a significant role in outside of being a citizen and being on the streets? 
um, you know, having okay, to do with so the visual field. That's a burning question. I think it's really important, and I have a couple of answers. One is that the understanding of the role of the visibility, the visibility of artists in society has changed dramatically over the past few decades. People see art as something in their lives in a way that they haven't in the past in our culture. When art was over there and life was over here, people get it. They don't see museums as restricted uh, temples. Um, that uh, are not for them. There uh, are many family and child-friendly policies. There's a greater inclusion where people can see work by people who they identify with, who look like them. Really important issue because the role of the artist as a symbolic interpreter and condenser in society is ever more important. There's a problem with celebrity which is not a small thing, it's a big thing. Uh, and a problem with scapegoating artists as a result of that, but also as too much reverence in a sense. A confusion with Hollywood celebrity culture and so on, but look at the confusion between a reality TV star and a politician, though this is something that recurs in history. Uh, so the the role of the artist has changed, and the ability of the artist to be inserted as an artist is really important. I think we need to look back to Occupy. I actually wrote an article called The Artistic Mode of Revolution, which was about the fact that Occupy had so many artists participating, partly because artists are able to shift their time often. Uh, but it's more than that, it's the idea of what I say, every social movement needs a horizon. And artists are always involved in some kind of utopian thinking, whether it's real or imaginary. Nevertheless, artists believe in a kind of universalized and ameliorative utopian social state. Artists have a messianic streak. Sometimes that's just a pain in the ass, but other times, it leads toward communitarian and rebellious behavior, but not just tantrum rebellion, but actual directed resistance. And I think that the willingness of artists, because after all, we're trained to be innovative and different, and sometimes that leads to a kind of narcissism, but we can snap out of that. And I think that is why artists have Ever since artists stopped just being the creatures of their patrons about 200 years ago, artists have always participated in a revolutionary movement. I mean, think of the photo of Courbet with the Place Vendôme column. He wound up going to jail over that uh, by 1871 on uh, the Paris Commune. So yeah, artists have the capacity. You could also have a regular life, but I, I really believe that art doesn't change society. People change society, social movements change society, but there is no social movement without artistic expression. Well, how's that for arousing a call? I, I truly believe this though. Last one. Hi, um, I have a sort of multi-level question that I'm hoping can be sort of easily answered. Um, but my question is, um, does any of your work directly criticize the Obama administration's military agenda? Also, um, with that, is it important to criticize liberals as much as conservatives when it comes to war? Does he get a free pass because he's so well liked by liberals in the artistic community? And then I'm thinking specifically about your anti-drone um, work. Was that in any way like criticizing his drone policy and who else the would be criticizing? Who was well, the right, president? Yeah. So <laughs> I guess there's a lot of parts to that, but yeah. Yeah. You know, there's a nice Phil Oaks song. If you don't know Phil Oaks, you gotta look him up. O C H S O C H S. Love me, love me, I'm a liberal. <laughs> I 
I'm not a liberal, sorry. Um, one of the problems under the Obama administration was that he was such a decent, honorable, lovable, intelligent, rational being that his role as the head of state was hard to assail, especially because he was facing a complete party of no on the part of the Republicans. So the anti-war movement collapsed. Um, and yet it didn't collapse completely. And yes, my drone project was directed exactly against the development of military drones and of course surveillance drones as well. Um, nice that he pardoned Chelsea Manning. Unexpected and amazing. He wasn't gonna pardon Snowden, but what he said about Chelsea Manning's uh, revelations was in effect that there was a lot of things there we needed to know about. It was, you know, I'm paraphrasing wildly. That actually he did a service to the U.S. much as he hated to admit it, you know, in his typical understated fashion, he was acknowledging that there were crimes committed by our troops that needed to be exposed. So think about it, he commuted the guy's sentence. It would have been good if he pardoned him, I'm not going there. But the problem is, Obama is not the president now. This is really an amazing moment because this administration came into power refusing even to pass through any of the gatekeeping, including ethics stuff on his own part, his taxes, and his cabinet nominees haven't even been vetted, and yet they've been approved. Also, all kinds of rules about military men have been abrogated. This is why I say we're in a state of emergency or a state of exception, though Agamben told us we were in a state of exception a long time ago once we started torturing people. The reason I played that clip was to remind you that back in 1982, torture was barbaric. Everyone agreed that only Nazis tortured people. Meanwhile, we were supporting and abetting regimes that tortured people, but at least we denied it and pretended that we weren't assisting people in Argentina or Chile to torture people and in many places in Africa. So you might want to write a history of the bad things that Obama did and I don't, I'm not saying that in the most, in any degree dismissively. There wasn't enough attention, but on the other hand, at the moment, there's an urgency and I think that the sentimentality toward Obama is justified. You know, you can say, yeah, there was Obama the president, and then there was his vision of what civility and progress. So he's a neoliberal, so he's not your best friend. Nevertheless, there was a vision there that was, compared to what we have now, you know, it was something at the top of the well that we're falling down. So my answer to that is, yeah, we could take the time to criticize Obama, but unfortunately that moment has passed. It passed less than five days ago. Is there anything else burning? Because if not, we should rush off, if you will, to protest. For me, this is really important. I have to say I'm gonna be going in a wheelchair. <laughs> But I hope you'll join me, or yourself. Thank you. Well, thank you, Martha.